All right, now in Luke chapter 19, lots of great stories in this chapter. We'll be focusing in on this one parable that he gives, starting in um, verse number 11, that explains, it says, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So just to give you just immediately the context of this parable, the whole purpose that he gave it, is because they were real close to Jerusalem, and they thought that Christ was going to bring in the kingdom, basically, and set up his earthly reign on earth at that time. We know that Jesus Christ is going to come back to set up his millennial reign on this earth. We know that's going to, that's going to happen in the future. They didn't quite understand the prophecy. They thought because Jesus was there, because he came the first time, that, that that's when he was going to set up his kingdom. And um, he's explaining this parable to help to help them to understand that, but also to help them understand what it's going to be like in his kingdom. Okay, so here we have this parable, and basically what it is, right, there's a, a nobleman, it says, went into a far country to receive himself a kingdom and then to come back. So this guy goes away, and it says in verse 13, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. Pounds? Pounds is basically just like money, right? He gives them some money, okay? He gives them 10 pounds. Um, it's just a weight measurement, you know, obviously we have pounds today, but, um, and it says unto them, occupy till I come. So this guy, he has servants. He's got a bunch of servants and he says, look, you need to occupy. Now that word occupy, you know, we don't really use that too much the way it's used here. Um, if you, but if you think of your occupation, right? If you have an occupation, it's a job, right? It's, you're doing work. If you have an occupation, that's what you're doing. Occupy till I come means I want you to do work. I want you to, to occupy. I want you to be busy. I want you to be doing work for me until I come. And that's why we see when, when they come back and they reckon with them, because he says, okay, I'm giving you 10 pounds. Here, here, you know, here's what I'm giving you. Occupy, work, do something with this. And that's why they come back and say, okay, well, look, the pound that you gave me, I got 10 pounds off of that. And he's pleased. He said, great, you know, good job. Here, because you did that, now you're going to rule over 10 cities. Because remember, he just came back with his, I mean, having received his kingdom, right? He went away to go get his kingdom. He comes back, and now he's, he's dealing with his servants. Okay, I, I left. I left you in charge of this business. What did you do? Oh, great. You multiplied it tenfold. Hey, you're going to rule over 10 cities. The next guy, you know, well, I, I gained five pounds. Good job. Great. You're going to rule over five cities. Good job. But then we see the guy, and, and this, is, this is extremely important because this ties in, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, but um, when Jesus Christ comes back to set up his kingdom, these are rewards, I believe, that are going to be given to us for the work that you've done for Christ. This is exactly what you know, he's given this parable to help us understand that, that this is referring to his second coming and to his, you know, and to his giving out of these rewards. When he has his kingdom set up, People are going to be ruling and reigning with Christ, the Bible says. That's the, those are rewards that are going to be given to believers that do work for God. But look at what happens to the guy that didn't occupy, the guy that didn't do any work. Look at verse number um, 20. It says, And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. So this guy's afraid. He's afraid to go out and do anything with his talent. He's afraid maybe that he might lose it. He's afraid for, for all these different reasons. He's afraid, and that fear keeps him from doing the work that his master told him to go out and do. And because of that fear, he, just, he, he has to go before his, his master and say, Well, here, you, you gave this to me. Here we go. Here it's back again. There you go. You gave me that, now I'm giving it right back to you. That's yours. And look at his response. In verse 22, it says, And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. So he calls him, look, because he didn't go out and do the work, because he didn't increase what he had given him, he calls him a wicked servant. And we need to take that to heart today. Because Jesus is giving this parable for us to understand, hey, look, all of these people in this parable here are servants. Because you notice later what he does with his enemies. 
the ones that said, we will not have this man to rule over us, they weren't his servants. He says, but those my enemies, in verse 27, which would not that should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. See, the enemies are the people that would represent people who are unsaved. Right? Those that are not believers. But the servants are the believers. So some people are doing a lot of work for God. Hey, they're going to reap a lot of rewards. Some people can do some work for God. I mean, they, they do what they can. You know, they've, they've done, hey, maybe it's only fivefold. Other people doing tenfold. You know, everybody's doing different amount of work for God. And they're getting rewarded accordingly, according to how much work they did, how, how much increase they've had. That's what he's rewarding them with. But look at what he says to the one who decided not to do any work. I was afraid. I didn't want to go out and do the work. I didn't, you know, whatever the reason may be, he's reckoning with this man. He says, thou wicked servant. Now, I don't know about you, but when I die, I don't want God to, to, to you know, come up to me and say, okay, well, what did you do? Where are your works? Well, I'm saved. You know, here I am. He's going to say, you wicked servant. And look what happens to him then, too. It says, um, you know, because he says in verse 23, Where, Father, gavest not thou that my money into the bank, that my, at my coming I might have required my own with the usury. Verse 24, And he said unto him, them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. So not only does this guy not get rewarded with like ruling over one city, he says, no, we're going to take that pound, we're going to give it to this guy who, who put forth the most work. He's going to get blessed even more. Now, this guy doesn't get killed before him. Again, I want to make that clear. You know, this guy still is going to enter into the kingdom with his master that, that came and brought the kingdom. He's still a servant. He's still going to be in the kingdom, but he's not going to be ruling reign with anything. He's not receiving any rewards. Actually, whatever it was that he did have got taken away from him. You know, the little bit, the little bit that he did have. And this is important to notice. Look, people have a mentality today that thinks, you know, all sin, on one end of the spectrum, all sin is equal. They say, you know, there's no bigger sin or less sin. Look, that's a sermon in and of itself, but that is not true. Okay? Um, you know, telling a a fib of, you know, like we're playing a game last night, <laughs> is, is, is in a way different, but I'm not saying we're sitting playing a game last night, but, um, <laughs> just a joke. but anyways, you know, tell us all a small fib or something, again, not to make too much light of it, because God looks at all sin as serious, but there are levels and degrees of sin, it's not the same as murdering somebody. It's not the same as just going out and killing people in cold blood. They're not the same. God has this whole book of the law, and there's different punishments that are, that are measured out based on the crime that you've done. Some might require, you know, just a financial settlement. Others might require, hey, a hand for a hand, a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, you know. Those are things that happen. They're just judgments, okay? Not all sin is equal, but at the same token, okay? Now, all sin might deserve a hell. They do. But there's, the Bible even talks about different levels of hell. There are, there are the deepest hell, right? There's, there's a place reserved for the wickedest of sinners that's going to be, if you can imagine it, I mean, hell is going to be horrible no matter where you are in hell. But even the deepest, darkest parts of hell is going to be even worse than other parts of hell. No matter what, you never want to be in that place. But there are, there are levels and degrees of punishment there. Heaven's the same way. Okay, look, it's going to be fantastic to be in heaven. To be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm in heaven. That is great. Just as, much as, as, as much as it is horrible to be in hell at all, in any part of hell, that's how great it's going to be in heaven. But it doesn't mean that everybody's just going to be equal either. When, when this kingdom is set up, people are going to be receiving different levels of rewards based on what you do. This is something that's real. That's why over and over again you, hear the, you see the verses in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, talking about laying up treasures for yourself in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal. Look, those are real. He's not just saying that for no reason. You can literally lay up treasures for yourself that have eternal, lasting value that will be with you forever. It's an inheritance that you can keep Along with just being saved and being in heaven, you will have, you know, rewards. And I don't know exactly what all of those rewards will be, but we know that they're going to be great. The Bible talks about how, how fantastic they're going to be. 
And, um, you know, we can trust if God is so merciful and so loving to give us a free gift of salvation, what are his rewards going to be like? I don't know, but God is an awesome, great, merciful, loving God. Whatever it is he's going to give us is probably going to blow us away uh, above what we would even think that they might be. And to think that there's these, these rewards that you can receive. Look, he commands us as his servants. We are God's servants to go out and do work for him. We are commanded to go out and, 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 and reap and sow and do all these things that he's given us hard work to do. You don't want to die and, and, and be faced with God and he takes away the little bit that you do have because you decided not to work, because you were afraid, because you said, you know what? I don't like to talk to people. It scares me. I'm afraid. I don't want to go up and knock on somebody's door because I, what if they slam the door in my face? Hey, I'm a, you know, what, what do people think of me? Out of fear, preventing you from doing the work that God commanded you to go out and do. God commands us to go out and to preach the gospel to every creature and to get other people saved. That is our job. We cannot let fear take over and say, no, I'm not going to do that, or no, I've got too many other things going on in my life. I don't have time to serve you, God, because look at what's going to happen when, when you're facing heaven. And you know what? We're on this lifetime for an extremely short period of time. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. It's going to be gone in no time. But eternity is a long time, forever. I mean, it's, it's hard. You can't even grasp that. It's hard to comprehend. How long is forever? I mean, we're here. It's, I mean, in a blend. And I'm, I'm young. I'm only 37 years old. But, I mean, I can look back and be like, man, where did those years go? And it seems like it accelerates the older you get. It just seems to go faster and faster and faster and faster. Our time is so limited. That's why it's so important. Hey, if you're going to work at anything, work at something that's going to give you those rewards. Something that you're going to have, that you'll be able to keep with you forever. You know, Bible, you, people say, you know, you can't, you can't take it all with you. Or you, can't, um, you definitely can't take your wealth with you that you have here, the physical things you accumulate, but that you, are, you can take something with you. You can take the eternal rewards that you earn and lay up for yourselves in heaven. And that's based on, as a result of the work that you do down here for God. Now, I'm going to use this same example here. That we the, a similar parable, but let's let's use a similar parable in in today's. It's something that you might just hit home with you, right? If you have a work, if you've ever worked for anyone before, think about your boss coming to you and saying, "Okay, I'm going away. You know, I'm going on vacation for a while. I'm going to be out of the office. I'm going to be out of here. I need you to run things. I need you to take care of things. I need you to keep the business going, and we need to stay profitable." In order to keep the lights on, obviously, you're in charge of this while I'm gone. Right? And he gives you specific instructions. says, okay, you know, I need you to do this and this and this. You know, if you could at least do this, you know, this is what I'm tasking you to do. This is what I want you to do. And then he comes back. Right? And you tell him, and he says, okay, well, how did things go? Where are we at? You know, how, how many more sales have we had or whatever? What, how are we doing? What have you been doing? Or he comes back and just say, well, you know, we didn't really grow at all. Actually, it's just, you know, we, we, we actually lost some money. But what have you been doing? Well, I actually decided to, to go out and start my own business, and I've been doing all these, this other work, and I've been, you know, I've been, I, I took some, some time off, and I did, you know, I was just kind of doing things that I thought felt good, you know, that whatever I wanted to do. I mean, how ridiculous would that be and how angry you think your boss would be with you for charging you with that task and then to come back and you just, you just blew him off, you know, you did your own thing, but he comes back and like, what are you doing? You know, I'm employing you, I'm paying your salary, I'm the one who's in charge of you, you know, I task you with this job, you didn't do it. You know, obviously in this, in this illustration you get fired, but, but think about that from God's perspective. Okay, because we are his servants. And he has tasked us with jobs. He has tasked us with jobs to do. If we decide just to do, you know what? I don't really feel like doing that. I'd rather go out and 
and you know, I want to read my books, I want to watch movies, and I want to go swimming, and I want to do, you know, like, like whatever it is, however you want to fill your day, right, with the stuff that you do. Just say, I, I don't really feel like, I don't feel like, like witnessing anyone, I, I don't feel like doing that. <laughs> How is God going to, going to, th- I mean, you have to think about this, and we have to think about this on kind of a regular basis to keep ourselves in the right mindset of who we really are. Because the Bible says that you are bought with a price. Okay, Jesus Christ, when he died for your sins on that cross, when he paid for everything, he bought you. You belong to God. He, he, he bought everything up. He bought up your debt. You belong to him. You ought to serve him. I mean, he gave it to you for free. You ought to at least love him for that. And if you love him, you ought to serve him. But you also ought to serve him because he owns you. You belong to God. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 4. You're in Luke. Just turn over to John chapter 4. We're going to see a couple more places here that, that talk about working and laboring and receiving rewards. As we saw here in Luke 19. John chapter 4, look at verse number 34. Again, Jesus speaking, John 4, 34 says, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. He's saying, don't you say these things? Look, there's four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto a life eternal, that both he that soweth And he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labor. So Jesus Christ is telling his disciples, they're saying, look. Look up. Lift up your eyes. The fields are white on the harvest. They're they're ready for you. the, The pickings are ready to go. Work has already been done. Other people have come before you, and they've sowed the seed, and they watered, and they did all these things. Look at all these people out here that are just ready to get saved. This is a this is a soul winning parable. He's telling, and I mean, you hear this all. You probably heard many sermons preach on the fields being white at the harvest, right? Jesus Christ telling, but look, harvesting. If you know anything about the way things work at all, harvesting is hard work. Right? When harvest times come, going out into the fields, going out into the whatever crops they are, and reaping and putting the sickle to it and doing all that, that's hard work. I mean, you're going to be out there from sun up to sun down, gathering and reaping and doing all this work. It's the same thing with sowing. It's the same thing with plowing. It's the same thing. Everything involved with bringing forth fruit, with bringing forth life. All of that stuff that's involved requires a lot of hard work and effort. And this is what we're called to do. That's why Jesus says, um, I sent you to reap that where I need to sow. Hey, look, that's what he sent them to do. I'm telling you, go reap. That's your job. Don't come back to me and say, I didn't reap anything. Here, here's your sickle back. Thanks for, thanks for giving me this tool. He's given us a tool right here. We need to use this. Know it, learn it, and go out and reap. That's what we're called to do. We need to get this job done for Christ. You don't want to be, face him and say, look, I didn't do anything for you. And he also says, I mean, in, in verse 36, it says, and he that reapeth receiveth wages. And I believe one of the reasons why, you know, say, why does God even give us wages anyways? We're his servants. We ought to do it. And that's right. That's the attitude we ought to have is that, look, God is your master and he's telling you to do this. You just do it. I mean, he's giving you salvation. That should be enough as it is. But I think what the reason why he, he also pays us for the good works that we do is because he's magnifying the fact that salvation is completely free. So regardless of how much work you do for him, hey, you're still saved because he bought and paid for that. And on top of that, then, he's just going to say, you know what, because you did this work, I'm also going to pay for you for that, just so that you don't even think that your salvation has anything to do with how many good works that you've done. I'm also just going to pay you for that. And, and, it's, and it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's a great truth, but... Um, we need to remember this. Look, it's and it's not all just work. There's there's so many incentives for doing this. There's so many incentives. You do it out of love. We're kind of focusing in today on the wages, on the things he's gonna give us, on the rewards that we're gonna get. 
But it's also, we see, you know, there was, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In that, in that previous parable in Luke 19, we saw, you know, the guy that didn't do any work, the guy that didn't occupy, the guy that didn't do what God had told him to do, hey, he lost the little bit that he did have going into it. The, the little bit that, that, that God had blessed him with, that God had given him, you know, he, he took that away. And said, I'm going to give it to this guy because this guy really worked hard for me. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. We're going to see a little bit here of the passage on the, the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to start reading in verse number 5. The Bible says, Who then is Paul? 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Again, this illustration of planting and watering. Now, are they literally physically planting and watering? No. He's talking about the word of God because, you know, the Bible says that God's word is like a seed, right? He often likens that to a seed. You go out and you, and you plant it and you water it and you sow that seed. You sow the seed of God's word into people's hearts. And he's using the same illustration to get them to know, look, we're doing different works. When I go out soul winning and I talk to people at the door and I preach in the gospel, hey, not everybody gets saved. Not everybody is getting reaped, you know, in, in a sense of, of, hey, great. Now there's fruit there because they're saved, they're a new life, and I'm reaping that harvest. No, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you're going out and you're just planting that seed. Sometimes you're watering it. Other people may have been talking to that person. And they've, and they've thought about it. They've heard God's word. and It's been sown in their hearts. But now you're going and, and, you're, and you're just bringing it up again. Saying, hey, look at this. And you're watering and trying to get that ground ready to go. You're working on it. You're plowing. And you still might not reap yet. But then someone else later might come along and then, hey, great, now they're ready. Now they're getting it saved. And now they reap on that. And the Bible's saying here too that, hey, look, the person who sowed, the person that watered, and the person that reaped, you're all going to get rewarded for that work that you do. So don't ever get discouraged either when you go out sowing and, hey, people, that, people just aren't getting saved. Man, this is so rough. It's, hey, you don't know what's going to happen in the course of their entire life. When you go out and do God's work, the Bible says that will doubtless come rejoicing. Um, you know, he that, that beareth grain shall doubtless come rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's why we sung that song this morning, you know, bringing in the sheaves. Because it's doubtless, it will happen. If you go out and preach God's word, if you go out and sow that seed, it will, it will come back to you. Now, we don't know exactly how much necessarily, and you might not see it physically with your eyes, the results of everything that you do, but it will come back, and, and, and you will be rewarded for it too. Look at verse number 7 there. It says, So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. And of course, these people just, you know, in uh, Corinth were, they were kind of lifting up individuals. They're saying, you know, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. You know, they're saying like, well, this is who I follow. And this is, you know, and they were kind of making this, this cult of person. They were making these, these almost idolizing, in a, in a sense, you know, the man. of just cause, and, and they were great men of God, but they were kind of sectioning themselves off and saying, well, I follow Paul. And I follow Paul. And he's saying, look, we're just workers. God's the one ultimately that gives the increase. Okay, we're just out here, we're doing his work, we're doing what he told us to do. God's the one that gives the increase. And that's true. That, that is as true as the day is long. Look, we're commanded to go out and do this work. And it's not going to get done if we don't go out and do the work. But God is the one, through the Holy Spirit, who is, who is doing, you know, who is going to give that increase. And it's his word and all the glory belongs unto him. Verse number 8 says, He that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So it's saying there, look, we're laborers. And we're laborers together with God. God is working with us. When we do God's work, he's not just leaving us all alone. That's why it says ye are God's husbandry. What's husbandry? It's like we're his animals. We're his workhorses. We're the oxen, you know. He's going to be driving us. He's going to be directing us. He's going to be leading us and, 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 you know, and pushing the way forward. But we're the workhorse. We're the ones that are down here to be doing this. We're his husbandry. We're his building. We're laborers together with God. We're doing work. And laborers work. Don't deceive yourself. Don't think that it's just going to be easy and that you can just skate through and it's not going to be any work and it's not going to be any sweat. It's not going to be anything that requires any kind of effort. The Christian life requires lots of effort. Verse number 10, it says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me, 
As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, in Luke 19, the, the, the starting uh, chapter that we read, the king is rewarding his servants based on the results of their labor, right? Those that gained more money were given cities to rule and reign over, right? Those that did more work, those that produced more, that had more increase, they received more of a reward. John 4, what we saw just a little while ago, talks about the work involved with reaping a harvest, right? That's where he likened it to going out and reaping at harvest. People work doing the sowing, doing the reaping. Right now in 1 Corinthians 3, he did a little bit of the talking of the, of the sowing and reaping, but then he kind of shifts gears into a building. People building thereupon and laying a foundation and building, right? It says, um, now here it's clear, he, he states that, that the foundation is Christ. That's the foundation. That's the starting point. That's the base of what we're building on. But he follows that up. Um, but well, it's also interesting here that it says, Paul says that I laid the foundation. Right? In um, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builder thereupon. Paul's the one that laid that foundation of Jesus Christ for other people. He was, you know, and, and that's our job too. When you get somebody saved, when, some, when you go out and preach the gospel to someone, they receive Christ as their Savior. Hey, Christ is their foundation. That now you're, you're building. I mean, again, he's using this illustration of building. You're building a house. You're building a building, right? You're building a structure. You have to lay the foundation first before you can do anything else. And when and he's using that, that illustration to help us understand soul winning. When, and when you're dealing with people, hey, first you need to get that foundation. You know, it's pointless to go and try to preach Bible doctrine and all these, these you know, deep subjects or whatever to someone who's not even saved. If they don't have Christ as the foundation, it's, it's not going to stand. You're not going to be able to explain all these different truths of the Bible to people if they don't even have the foundation laid. I mean, you could try to build thereupon all these other great truths and everything else, but it's, it's pointless if you don't have a good foundation, if you don't have the right foundation. It's going to be as, as shifting sands. So we need to build that foundation first with people in general. Just, just go out and preach the gospel, obviously. And as what Paul said, that he did that. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I got that person saved. Right? We know that Jesus Christ gets, did, you know, empowers us to do that. We know that Jesus Christ is the one, he's working with us, and he's the one that gives the gift of salvation. He's the one that did all the hard work, and he's the one that receives all the glory for that. However, the Bible in many places refers to, you know, Paul said, you know, the Bible says some, um, on some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear. So it's about you, it's commanded you to save others with fear. Um, hate, um, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Or pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And Paul said, I am become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So there's nothing wrong with saying like, I got this person saved. It's completely biblical. And we see here, I mean, he laid that foundation of Jesus Christ. We're doing work. You literally are going out and you're doing work and you're, and you're trying to lay that foundation of Christ. But then how are you going to build upon that? Now, if you're saved today, you have a foundation of Christ. How are you going to build your building, right, that is founded on Christ? And he explains here that, look, um, in verse 12, Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, Wood, hay, stubble. Now, are, are any of those things sinful or wrong or bad? 
I mean, I don't see anything wrong with gold or silver or precious stones or wood or hay or stubble, right? I mean, none of it's just none of it's necessarily sinful. But it's not all going to last, right? So the Bible is saying here in verse 13, it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, if, you're, if, this, if all the work that you're building upon your foundation is going to be tried by fire, well, what's going to last? Is, the, is gold going to last through fire? Sure, gold will, gold will last through fire. Silver, precious stones, those things will abide through a fire. But you know it's not? Wood, hay, and stubble, those are going to be burned up. And they're just going to be gone. It's just going to be consumed. Because they, they can't stand the fire. Fire is going to burn up. But these other things, the stones and the, and the precious metals and stuff, yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're going to withstand that fire. They're going to last through. It says um, in verse 14, it explains that if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So God's going to take all the works that you've done in your life. And it's not talking about sin here. That's why I said there's nothing wrong with like wood, hay, and stubble necessarily. If I were to go out and start a business and, and make a bunch of money and you know, do whatever, there's nothing sinful with that or wrong just in, in going out and doing that kind of a work. But that type of work that I'm building, that has no eternal value whatsoever. It's, it's, it, it is what it is. It's, it's wood, it's hay, it's stubble. But when I'm standing before Christ and he's doling out rewards for the work that we do for him, that's, that's up and smoke. It's gone. Because it's not important. It's not important to God. And that's not what God told us to do with our time and to do with our energy and to do with our efforts. It's not what he told us to do. He told us to do this other work. And if we do it for him, hey, you'll get that gold, that silver, those precious stones. And he's going to try them up and say, hey, look, look at all this. Look at all this that's left with what you've done. Now, we're all going to have some wood, hay, and stubble in our life. We all do. Everybody's going to have some of that. There's not one person who's not going to have that except for, you know, Jesus Christ. But we all have wood, hay, and stubble. We all have things that we do. You know, and again, it's not sinful. It's just... There's nothing wrong with, with taking a break or taking a vacation or going out and just having a little bit of fun. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not sinful. But that better not define your life. That better not be all you ever do. Right? I mean, you want to be laying up for yourself the work. It says, if any man's work, in verse 15, shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So again, the same concept that we saw in Luke 19 of a person being, they're still saved. Right? Just because you suffer loss, you lose it. Hey, that little bit that you had, that's gone. The same thing that happened to, that, to, the, to the wicked servant in Luke 19. Yet he still entered into the kingdom. And it says here, yet he himself shall be saved. You're still saved. You're still going to go to heaven. But you're going to have nothing. I mean, you're, you're going to be in heaven and that's going to be it. You know, there you are. You know? um, and it, it makes sense too. I mean, if people are going to be ruling and reigning, well, some people are going to be ruling and reigning. Some people aren't. Right? Some people will be ruled and reigned over. Um, in order to rule and reign, there has to be people to, to, to be ruling and reigning over. Right? And it's just, that's just the way it's going to be. And there are a lot of people out there that I think are going to be surprised at a lack of rewards and actually have suffering loss and, and people not getting things when they expect to get stuff. Now, um, In all of these verses, it talks about going out and laboring. And in every single one, there's this, there's this reference of, of an increase and, and reaping. And you can see how clearly it's tied in with winning souls to Christ. With going out and, and harvesting and reaping. And, and really, that's the main theme of all of these, is going out and winning people to Christ. See, a lot of people think that, like, well, you know, I read the Bible and I pray. So God's going to reward me for that. I don't necessarily believe that that's true. Okay, and the reason why is because, okay, you reading the Bible and you praying, where's the increase? Now, those are great things to do, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. We need to do those things, but those things are all going to help you to become a better laborer. They're going to help you be more efficient, to be a better laborer, to go out and do more work for God. It's actually going to bring forth increases. It's actually going to, going to bring, have a positive net result. Right? Um, there's no, again, there's nothing wrong with... I'm not trying to, to, to say that those things are bad in any way, shape, or form. I just don't see God handing out um, um, rewards based on, based on that. 
Um, because in all in, in, in these three sections for sure we see that that you know you need to go out and do some work. You need to go out and labor. And you know, a lot of people even think that, oh well, I'm obeying the commandments, right? I'm I'm getting sin out of my life. So I'm I'm obeying the commandments and God's gonna reward me for that. No. No, I, this one, <laughs> I don't think God's going to give out any rewards for not doing the things that he didn't tell you to do. Okay, he's going to reward you for doing the things that he tells you to do, but not for not doing the things. Like, oh, well, I kept myself from adultery. Well, good job. You, you think you're going to deserve a reward for that? No. All you're doing is just not going to be punished for that. That's it. You don't, you don't gain anything by obeying the commandments. And, but, but this is the way a lot of people think, and we can't think that way. Look, and again, there's nothing wrong with getting sin out of your life. Absolutely, get more sin out of your life as much as possible. Live a righteous, pure life. Read the Bible, pray, do all of these things. They're vital. They are very important for you and for your life. But as far as it goes in, in receiving rewards, that's a whole nother level, right? Look, the person that prays and reads the Bible gets sin out of their life, Amen. That's great, and God's going to be pleased. He's going to be happy to see that. He wants you to do that. He's going to be encouraging you to do that. The Bible encourages us to do that. But I don't think that that's how you earn the rewards. I think a lot of people have this mindset because they think, well, I'm doing all of this. I must be earning all these rewards. And I don't believe that's true. I think we need to go out and, and, and actually you know, convert a soul to Christ because if you think about it, that is eternal value. You already have your foundation built, Right? When you go out and start laying more foundations and a soul is converted from going to hell to going to heaven, hey, that's eternal value. That's eternal life that that person has now. That is something that will last. And um, I have this reference here. I'm going to bring it up now. Ah. I don't have it. That's okay. Anyways. I did have it. It's gone. That is eternal value, winning someone to Christ. It says, um, uh, I think it's in 1 Thessalonians. For a second, anyways, I'm going to turn there. It says, are not even ye are uh, rejoicing and crowned um, at his coming. And, it, and it, I'm totally butchering that verse too. Anyways, I'm not going to go into that anymore. But um, we need to work and labor to bring forth this fruit. Now turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 5. We're almost done. We're wrapping up soon. Hebrews chapter number 5. You know, just because you do things like, um, you know, not sinning and, 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 and praying and doing these things, you're not going to receive a reward for that, although it is very important to do that. And all those things are, excuse me, are going to help you just to become a better soul winner, to become a better worker, a better laborer for Christ. Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse 11. Now, if you truly want to grow in your Christian life, if you want to go to the next level, if you want to step it up and say, okay, I've been doing these other things, and look, they're all important, okay? Again, I'm not downplaying anything else here, but if you want to keep growing and keep moving forward, Doing the soul winning and, and, and you know, bringing people to Christ has to, is a vital part of your life. It's a vital part that's going to help you to continue to grow and to mature as a child of God. You don't want to stay a baby forever. We'll get to that in a second. You don't want to stay a baby uh, in, in Christ. You want to grow. And the only way you're going to grow is by doing this work. Look at Hebrews 5.11. It says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. <laughs> For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You see, there's a lot of churches across America today that are full of people that have been going to church for decades, for years and years and years, and they're learning and they think, you know, like they're hearing all this stuff, and he's saying, here, look, for the time, the amount of time that you've been here, you ought to be teachers. 
You, I mean, you've been here long enough. You've been listening to this long enough. You ought to be teachers. He says, ye have need that one teach you again. You've been here so long, you ought to be a teacher, but someone needs to teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracle of God. Look, the basics. You just need the basics. You've been here for so long. You want to get into all the deep stuff of God and, and you want to study the Bible so much and everything else. You're a babe in Christ is what he's saying. He says, um, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He says, look, you need the milk of the word. Don't worry about getting so deep in the Bible. You need the milk. You need to understand, look, you're a baby. You need to grow. You need to be strengthened. You need to go out and work. You need to do all these things. To grow, it says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Lots of words to hold in on there. Everyone that useth milk, so people who need that milk, it says they're unskillful in the word of righteousness. Now, how are you going to become skilled at anything? In order to become skilled, you're going to have to learn about it, but learning isn't enough. You have to do it. I worked in a machine shop for a couple years back in Chicago, and you know we had training classes and stuff. Now, I could have taken all of these classes all day long, but if I didn't actually go out and, and get my hands on a machine, I don't care how many hours I, was, I would be in a classroom studying this stuff and learning it, it doesn't mean I'm going to be able to do anything when I stand in front of that machine. I mean, you can learn the basics of just how to turn something on or whatever, but look, all of that knowledge is going to be useless. Useless. And I'm going to forget it. If I don't go out and put it to use, this is going to be gone. You need to be doing the work and learning at the same time. And that's why, you know, at that company, part of the process was, okay, you're, you're coming to work and you're doing the work on the machine. You go and you learn and then you keep putting into practice all the things that you learn and then that stays with you. I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, this is in the world. This is common, basic sense that we all ought to have. Hey, it's no different with the Bible and with serving God and laboring and working for Him, okay? You can't just hold up in your house and just read the Bible. I mean, if you could be reading 20 hours of the Bible a day, sleeping for four hours, just reading your Bible, reading it. Hey, look, you're not going to get that much out of it. You're, you're going to be just like a babe that still just needs that the first principles because you're unskillful in the word of righteousness no matter how much of the Bible you read. If you're not actually putting it to use, you need to become skilled with the word by putting it into use. And we're going to see that here. Turn, if you would, to, um, and well, here, verse 14, before we turn anywhere else, it says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It's the usage of the word. It's the usage of what you've learned that's going to, going to exercise you, right? And, and, and think about when you exercise you're strengthening yourself. You're building yourself up. You're building your body. You go out and run. You lift weights, whatever, that exercise. You're strengthening your body. You're building that body up. When you use God's word, you're exercising your ability to discern both good and evil. Discerning good and evil, hey, that's part of your knowledge. That's part of your wisdom. You're not going to get that wisdom and knowledge just from reading. You have to exercise the word. You have to use it. You have to put it into use. You'll gain that much more understanding and more, and more knowledge to be able to discern good and evil, by putting it to use. That's what, there's a lot of false doctrine out there today that, that, that comes from these scholars that don't go out and do anything. They just spend all their day reading books and reading books and reading books. And hey, go ahead and read some books, right? Read the Bible. The, again, there's nothing wrong with reading the Bible, but that ought not to be what you do all the time, and that's it. You need to balance that out with the amount of work that needs to be done. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to James chapter number 1. This is the last place we're going to turn. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I want to point, point that out there, because look, He's saying, look, you need to be doers. You need to take action. You need to do that. It's not just enough to come to church and to listen and to be a hearer. It's not just enough to pick up your Bible and read it. You need to be a doer. You need to put that into action. He says, if you don't, you're deceiving your own self. 
You're deceiving yourself if you're not being a doer and you're just a hearer. Verse 23, it says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So you're saying, look, if you don't do the work, if you don't apply the, the word, if you just hear it, and you don't take action on it, you don't do anything about it, he says you're like a man, you behold your face, you see what you look like, you see a reflection of yourself, right? You can spot whatever is wrong. I mean, you can say, oh, my hair is messed up. You know, I, I have whatever is going on. I can actually see myself from in a reflection of who I am. He says, you're like a man. You see what you're like. You see your natural face. He says, but you go away and you just straightway forget what you just saw about yourself. Whatever whatever it is, good, bad, anything that you see, all, anything in your reflection, anything that... that you can see who you are. He says straightway, just right away, you just go and you just forget You forget everything you just saw. If you don't put this knowledge, what you hear, into use, you're going to forget it. Okay, it's just like my example with the, with the training. If I get all this training and I'm in a classroom and stuff, and I never go and put any of that to use, hey, over time, you're going to forget that. I learned, you know, Spanish. I was much better at speaking Spanish before than I am now. Because, you know why? Because I don't use it very often. There's not very many people I communicate with. Now, when I'm using it every day, guess what? I'm, I'm honing that skill. I'm, I'm improving on it. I'm, I'm getting better at it. I'm getting more comfortable with it. You know, it's the same thing with going out and preaching the gospel. But the first time I went out soul winning, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare for me. It was just, it was, I mean, I was, I was stumbling over my words. I literally dropped my Bible on the ground. I mean, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I was, I was scared. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I kind of didn't know what I was doing at all. But the more you go out and do it, and the more you hear, the more you learn, you go back out, you keep on going, you keep on pushing, you keep on working, you keep on laboring. Hey, you're going to be more skillful. You're going to build on that skill and you're going to, you're going to sharpen and improve on it and become better at it by, by doing that type of work. If you just hear and you don't do anything, you're basically just deceiving yourself. You're going to forget all the stuff that you learn. You're going to forget everything that you hear. And, and um, it says in verse 25, it says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So you're going to be blessed. If you go out, if you not only hear what the Bible has to say, but you actually do it. You actually incorporate it into your life. You actually make the changes necessary, whether it be getting out sin, whether it be going out preaching gospel, whatever it may be. If you hear something preaching, you see it in the Bible, and you see instruction from God, but you don't, you don't take any action on it, you don't do it, you're going to forget about it. It's not going to be, you're going to, your mind's going to be wrapped up in the next thing. It's, it's, I mean, it's just part of the way we are, but the Bible even says that you know it's true, it's going to happen. You need to take action on it. You need to act today. You need to act immediately. Now look, you're in church this morning. You're hearing God's word preach. Don't just be a hearer. Don't hear a sermon like this and think, well, maybe I should go out soul winning sometime. Because if you think that way, you say, well, maybe I should just go out sometime. You're probably not going to do it. You don't want to be a forgetful hearer. Because something else is going to come up. Something else is going to get in the way. And you're going to forget you know, the face that you just saw in the mirror, you're going to forget the truth that was just preached to you, and you're going to, it's just going to, just kind of go in the, in the back seat and, and go in the back of your mind until it just gets, gets pushed further and further and further out of your recollection because there's so many things going on in our daily lives. You need to be able to make a decision to say, no, I am going to do this. You know, there's a difference between maybe I should go out and do this or, oh yeah, that makes some sense. Yeah, I should, I should probably do that and saying, no, I'm going to do this. No, this is something that I am going to do. I'm going to not just be a hearer. I'm going to be a doer of the work. Look, I don't want God to look at me and say, what have you done for me? And I have nothing to show him. I don't want God to come and reckon with me and say, hey, where's the eternal value? What have you done? What have you built upon the foundation of Christ that I gave you? I want to be someone who's going to have lots of rewards. When I get that, I want to say, God say, hey, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
You know, you've been faithful over a little. I'm going to give you a lot. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. And, I'm going to, and, and I, that's, that's what I want to happen when I, when I go to heaven. I want to have lots of rewards built up. I want God to be pleased with me. And I don't know if you're, I mean, I, you guys are probably all the same way. I was just thinking about this last night. You know, I, I love the, the, the understanding of us being God's children. I love that. I love the fact that he's our father. And being a father, I, I just I have so much understanding of how much I love my children, and how much they please me, and how much joy comes to my heart when they when they listen to me and do nice things, and you know, and, and when they're being good and, and, and obedient and every and everything else. And when I do the things that I ask them to do, I love that. And, it, and it's this great feeling of love. I hope, and, and I was just thinking this last night, this, you know, I wish that I would be, God could look at me and say, you make me happy. You know that I, I'm, 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 I actually have joy for you listening and doing and doing something for me. That's what I want to have God to have that type of an image. And I, I, I hope that that's the image He has. I pray that is what it is. And I'm going to work my hardest to make sure that that He is pleased with me. And I think that we all ought to have that same type of understanding and that same type of an attitude. So maybe this is an area that you haven't done very much with. Maybe you've done a lot of work in other areas of getting sin out, reading the Bible, doing other stuff. Hey, if you want to grow, if you want to stop being a babe in Christ, look, you need to go out and be a doer of the work. And this is for everybody. Everybody. We need to grow. We need to become doers, not just hearers only. And I encourage everybody, we've got different soul winning times listed in the bulletins. Take advantage of them. If you've never done it before, don't worry. I will take you out personally and show you and, and, and help you through that. I'm not going to just, you know, expect you just to, to go out on your own, although I think God might. God probably does expect us to go out and do it, but look, it's not even that hard. I'll help you with that. I can help show you. I had someone else help show me, you know, hey, these are the verses I use. Hey, this is kind of how we talk to people and just, and just, you know, get someone to listen. And someone who's skillful, who's gone out and has just had lots and lots and lots of experience and training and biblical knowledge to, to, to help show you how to do this stuff. Take advantage of that. We have that here. I mean, who knows where you might end up? You might end up going, you know, to some other church or moving away or whatever. And maybe that's not going to be available somewhere else. Take advantage of that while you have it now. You have someone here that's, gonna, that's willing to take whatever time is necessary. I will work around your schedules to help you, to, to help show you how to do this and to win other people to Christ and to, and to be a worker, a laborer for God. Take advantage of it. My wife is here also as well. Ladies, if you want to go out and, and we, you know, I, prob I won't be going out soul winning with, a, with you know, like another married lady or single lady in the church, but my wife will go out with a lady, or we can go out in groups. I don't mind if there's a couple with me, if there's two or three people with me, that's fine. Okay, we can do that. Whatever it is that you want to do, um, you know, I can work with you on it. We have, um, we're going to have, we're going to be doing soul winners lunches on Sundays. Okay? Anybody who wants to Go out, because so, that's one of the sowing times that we have. You want to be a part of this. Hey, we'll feed you. I understand that you know church gets over right around lunchtime. You want to, you want to come. You want to stick around. You want to go out sowing. We'll feed you. You know the labor is worthy of his reward. We're gonna go out and 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 we can knock some doors and you can go out for however long you want to. Say so you got 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever time you have. You know, may, the time in here, usually, like, I might go out for three hours or four hours. You don't have to go out the whole time. It's not a big deal. Just get started. Decide to start somewhere. Decide today and just say, you know what? This time, this day, whatever's going to work out in your schedule, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it a point to, to become more skillful in the work. And, um, and I encourage everyone to do it because this is, this is the lifeblood of this church. I'll be honest with you. This, this is what our church is all about. The main focus, if you want to know what the main focus is of Word of Truth Baptist Church, the main focus is going out and reaching other people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. All the rest of the preaching, all the preaching on sin, all the preaching on everything else is designed to help you to grow and to become a better laborer, a more productive, a more efficient laborer for Jesus Christ and to get more people out saved. That is the goal. So everyone, it's everyone's job. I hope, I hope you'll take it to heart this morning. To say, you know what, I want to learn how to do this better. I want to do this more. 
and, and make that decision in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. God, help us all to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunities that you've given me and, and all the, the, the knowledge that, you, that you've bestowed upon me to this point, dear Lord. I pray that you please continue to, opening up, to open up my understanding. And Lord, help us all to have the right spirit within us. Help us understand that there's so many rewards we could earn. Help us to, to serve you out of our love for you and to be pleasing in your sight, dear God. And because we're so thankful for the, for the gift that you've given us, God, there's so many motivations and reasons, and, and even for love of others, dear God, especially when people are, are dying and going to hell every day. Help us to, to, to try to make as much of an impact as possible in people's lives that they can avoid that fate as, as we avoid that fate, dear Lord, from the gift that, that's been given unto us by other people who have done the sowing and the plowing and the watering, dear God, and the reaping. And I pray that you would please just, just stir us up this morning, dear God, and help us to become laborers for you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.